The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. Good morning, church. I hope you're having a blessed day today. Today, we're going back into Psalm chapter 79. This will be the last day we spend inside of this psalm. And then we're going to move into the next one. As you know, we are in a series called End Time Prophecy. And then you may be joining us for the first time, or you may have just started watching in this series. We are a lot of parts into it. I don't even remember how many we've done inside of this series so far. But you can find all of those on our website and then also on our YouTube channel. The links are on the website. For me, it's a little bit easier because they're just all listed one after another. Our website has everything outlined from our day, you know, all of the daily teachings in order. It has all of our Sunday services, so you can go and look there. And there is also a search bar on our website, so you're, you can also just search specific topics and it'll pull those things up as they find them on the website, which is actually very convenient. And I, people ask me all the time, how do you find your own stuff? Well, I, I use the website and I search it myself because it just makes it easier. But today I'm gonna go into Psalm chapter 79 again, and I wanna talk about two different things. Now, one of these things we've talked about so many times, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on it today, but there is something that we talked about during our discipleship curriculum this week when we talked about knowing the voice of God or knowing God's voice, that's lesson six or topic six in the BSM discipleship curriculum. But today we're going to talk about something that is referenced in Psalm 79 that actually ties in to what we talked about on Monday night in our BSM discipleship curriculum. So it's going to be a very fun lesson today. This will be, like I said, the last day we're in Psalm chapter 79, and then we're going to move forward I do want to go ahead and just announce something. Uh, we are going to start writing a new curriculum. This curriculum will be released sometime in the next month to two months. Uh, the Lord has just placed it on my heart. Last night, he woke me up and gave me the title for it and gave me the topics to write. Now, this is going to be very different than our other curriculums. Most of our curriculums are anywhere from you know a 23 topic curriculum a six month curriculum or a 12 week curriculum this is going to be an exclusive six week it's only going to have about six five or six topics inside of this curriculum but this curriculum is going to be very special because this is going to be our first level three class now this class is going to be specific for church planning for church leadership and for leadership in the body of Christ. That is what that curriculum is for. So if you are looking to start a ministry, if you are already in ministry, if you are looking to grow the leadership team at your church, this curriculum is going to be wrote specifically for that context. That's what this, that's what this curriculum is gonna be. It is going to be a shorter curriculum for that purpose so that we can teach it as an intensive, meaning we can teach it in one day or we can teach it in two days inside of a church. So if a church says, hey, we want you to come and teach our leadership for a weekend, this is the curriculum that we're gonna be teaching. We're gonna be teaching the fundamentals and the absolute most important aspects of understanding the word of God and understanding leadership in the church. The topics that I have been impressed upon, the Lord has shown me since our time here in Brazil, are the most vital aspects for leadership. So we're going to be writing a curriculum based on that. It's not going to be a very long curriculum, but it is going to be a very powerful curriculum because we're going to be writing it specifically for church leadership. So it is going to be our first level three class. I'm very excited. I've been waiting to hear from God on what we're going to do with level three curriculums. 
and it looks like they're going to be these short little intensives so that we can teach them in churches but we're going to be writing that very soon i'll be releasing more information on that as it comes available and as we get ready to release it this curriculum is also going to be something that we are not going to teach live so this curriculum is not going to have week by week studies we are going to pre-record the entire curriculum in one sitting so that way you have the curriculum and all of its topics together and that way if a leader of a church wants to buy the curriculum you'll get all of the videos also and then you can teach your church through this curriculum or if you were you know if we are near your location or if you would like to invite us we will be more than happy to come and teach it live in your church but that's not something that's going to be taught in the schedule monday tuesday or thursday nights those are specifically reserved for level one and level two classes the level three classes are going to be specifically for church leadership so if you are a leader of a small group if you are a, a pastor in a church if you are over multiple churches any of those types of context that's what this curriculum is going to be wrote for and we're going to be releasing it very very soon i'm going to begin writing it today i'm going to outline the curriculum and i'm going to start writing the entire book so we're going to have that released very soon so that way it is available for church growth and church leadership so let's pray and then let's jump right into the lesson today so father i thank you pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice let the word become wisdom revelation in the knowledge of your son spiritual seed sown producing in our body mind will and emotion transforming us by the renewing of our mind conforming us to the image of christ growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of christ god we love you and we thank you in jesus name amen and amen well, let's go to psalm chapter 79 we're going to go ahead and read through the entire psalm and then once we've read through it we'll take some time to go through it piece by piece oh god the heathen are come into thine inheritance Thy holy temple have they defiled. They have laid Jerusalem on heaps. The dead bodies of thy servants have they given to be meat unto the fowls of the heaven, the flesh of thy saints unto the beast of the earth. Their blood have they shed like water round about Jerusalem, and there was none to bury them. We are become a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and derision to them that are round about us. How long, Lord, will thou be angry forever? Shall thy jealousy burn like fire? Pour out thy wrath upon the heathen that have no that have not known thee, and upon the kingdoms that have not called upon thy name. For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his dwelling place. O oh, remember not against us former iniquities. Let thy tender mercy speedily prevent us, for we are brought very low. Help us, O oh God of our salvation, for the glory of thy name, and deliver us and purge away our sins for thy name's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is their God? Let him be known among the heathen in our sight, by the revenging of the blood of thy servants which is shed. Let the sighing of the prisoners come before thee. According to the greatness of thy power, preserve thou those that are appointed to die, and rend unto our neighbors sevenfold into their bosom their reproach, wherewith they have reproached thee, O Lord. So we, thy people, and sheep of thy pasture, will give thee thanks forever. We will show forth thy praise to all generations." Now, I just want to re-emphasize this point. We've already said it before, but Psalm 79 is eschatological. It comes to its greatest fulfillment in the generation in which the Lord returns. Now, it had partial fulfillments through history, through the captivity into Babylon, even the Assyrian captivity that came before that, and then also Persia, Greece, Rome, also what Antiochus Epiphany did. There's all sorts of partial fulfillments that you can see, and there's a reason why I mention this, because when you read commentaries and when you read what other people have written about these subjects and these chapters in the Word of God, you'll see all kinds of different interpretations sometimes, especially when it comes to the end time narrative. And this is for a couple different reasons. But there is some people that do not believe in the fulfilling of actual end time prophecy. They don't believe there's a real antichrist. They don't believe these things are going to come to pass. They just see it as symbolic and they see it as something that is not going to happen. We do not agree with that. We believe in a literal future fulfillment of end time prophecy. We believe in a little literal antichrist in a harlot Babylon in a great tribulation in a rapture of the saints. I mean, we agree with all these things. We believe in a second coming of Jesus. And the reason why these things are so important, and we've said this before, but I just want to reiterate this again, 
We are not talking about these truths to get into arguments with other people. That is not the point of these lessons. That is not why we study end time prophecy is to know more so we can debate and argue with people about who's right and who's wrong. The reason why we study end time prophecy is to prepare ourselves. Now, I was in a church recently, and I think this is a powerful truth. I was with a pastor, and if he ends up watching this, you'll know who I'm talking about. But we went to his office and we were we were talking and he was asking me about end time prophecy. He was asking me what I believed when it came to the great tribulation and the rapture of the saints. And so I answered his question the way I answer everybody's question when it comes to this subject. I talked about the harlot Babylon and I talked about the understanding of the harlot riding upon the beast before the beast is revealed on the world stage. So the harlot Babylon coming before the Antichrist. And we know that when the Antichrist is fully on the world stage, when he rips his mask off and shows himself to be a beast, that the harlot came before that. Well, the Antichrist ripping his mask off and showing himself to be a beast is the committing of the abomination of desolation, which marks the start of the Great Tribulation. So there is part of the church that believes that is when you are raptured or sometime before that. And then the other side of the church believes that you will be raptured at the blowing of the seventh trumpet at the end of the great tribulation. And a lot of the times the debate in the church where there is such division in the church is based on that specific truth. Whether you go up or you go up after the great tribulation, that's the debate. And what I tell people is you have this debate centered around the Great Tribulation. But there's something that's even more important. Before the Great Tribulation, there is seduction that will be touching the face of the earth, which will lead to the Great Falling Away. Because in you know 1 Timothy 4, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Meaning that there is a seduction coming to the earth that will cause a mighty wave of people falling away from the faith. Now, there is a great ingathering, too, through the great harvest in the generation in which the Lord returns, but there's a falling away from the faith. And I tell people all the time, one of the reasons why people will fall away is because of the seduction that leads to deception, leads to offense, and people fall away from God. But there is something that a lot of the church is not prepared for. It's They're not prepared for the harlot. And the harlot Babylon, it says, is drunk with the blood of the saints. And in Revelation 19, it says, all of the nations drunk of the wine of the wrath of the harlot, meaning they were participating all nations. So the martyrdom, the killing of Christians will be touching every nation on the face of this earth, not just in the Middle East, not just in Northern Africa, but all of the world. Martyrdom, the killing of Christians will be legal. And some people are not prepared for that reality. But you have to be prepared for that reality to not be offended at God and to be offended at people when these things begin to take place. So I believe the argument of the rapture of the church at the beginning or the end of the tribulation is not worth the argument. Now, of course, if you've been with us for any length of time, we believe in the rapture at the blowing of the seventh trumpet. And people say, do you argue the verses on the trumpet? No. When I talk about the rapture of the church, I believe in the fulfillment of the mystery of God. That's where I see this because I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it's 26 times. It talks about the mystery or the secret inside of the New Testament. And when it talks about the mystery or the secret, it's talking about the fullness of your salvation. And the only way you receive the fullness of your salvation is to receive the resurrected body and go be with the Lord which is the rapture of the church, which is declared to be the fulfilling of the mystery of God at the blowing of the seventh trumpet. So when we talk about the rapture, I don't talk about just a trumpet blowing. I talk about the fullness of the mystery of God. We don't have time to go through that today. But the reason why I make these points is we study end time prophecy, not to be in debates with people about what is what. I got a question on the, 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 the rapture. And I answer it talking about the harlot. And I even told the pastor at the end, I said, it may sound like I haven't even answered your question. I said, but I have. Because the point is, it doesn't matter necessarily whether you go up before or after. 
because right now the church is not even prepared for what's before. If you go up before the Great Tribulation, you will still go through the period of time in which the harlot Babylon is on the world stage. I said, and almost none of the church is prepared for that reality. I said, I'm concerned about that. Now, of course, we are going to prepare the people for the tribulation too, but there's something that's coming before that that all of us agree we will see. Even if you believe you go up before the tribulation, that means you agree you'll be here for the harlot. And even most of the church is not prepared for that reality. I know I just said a lot of things and I took most of the time today to to talk about this, but I want you to understand there are certain things that are not worth arguing. There are certain things that are of primary importance and there are certain things that are not of primary importance. And there are certain things that are worth the argument and there are certain things that are not worth the argument. I can have great fellowship with people that we disagree on things according to the word of God. We, we may not have the same viewpoints, but I, the way I teach the word of God prepares people even if we have different views. There's a reason why these things are important, because if all you did was argue every single point out of the Bible, you would ruin fellowship with a lot of people because it would just seem like conflict surrounds you. You know, I used to be like that when I was younger in my immature years because I wanted to argue every point out of the Bible. Now, can you do those things? Yes. But will you have great fellowship with all believers? No. It will cause division between you. You want to remove the division, come together, and be able to learn and receive from other people. That's a very important thing. Now, what I want to talk about for just a second, because we've spent most of the time just reiterating these truths again, I want to talk about the fact that the psalmist in Psalm chapter 79 at the very end talks about the people and sheep of thy pasture. Now, if you are in our BSM Discipleship Curriculum on Monday nights, we talked about knowing God's voice based out of the passage of John chapter 10. Now, if you've never read John chapter 10, John chapter 10 is a parable. It's a parable about the good shepherd, which is Jesus, and it's talking about the sheep. And it makes an important truth where it says, My sheep know my voice, and a stranger they will not follow, for they know not the voice of strangers. Now, if you go and you read that passage inside of the inside of the Greek, and some people have added, like, I'm not a, I don't claim to be a Greek or a Hebrew scholar. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to to claim any type of status like that. I know some Greek words and some Hebrew words because we study them. But there's a reason why when I read my Bible, I almost always read it with a concordance open also you know i have a concordance on my laptop on my phone on my ipad i use blue letter bible if i have internet but i'm always reading my bible with a greek or a hebrew concordance open because i want to know what these words mean because sometimes if you read this passage in john chapter 10 where it says i know not the voice of the stranger you may think well that means i never hear the voice of the devil and i always hear the voice of god you know, and you think it's about hearing it. But then it confuses a lot of Christians when you teach that way because you'll say, you know, you hear the voice of God and people go, okay, well, I, can't, I don't really know if I heard God's voice. I think I heard God's voice. And then the other side is, well, I know I heard the devil because I know that was a lie. It was a temptation. So I, and then they get confused because they think they heard God, but they don't know. They think that they're not supposed to hear the devil, so they don't understand why they are. And they and they get into this conflict about what does it mean to hear the voice of God? And so this is why understanding the Greek words, obviously because the English language does not have enough words to be able to describe this effectively, is that when it talks about in John 10, hearing the voice of the good shepherd and a stranger you will not follow, for you know not the voice of strangers, when it talks about that parable in John chapter 10, what it's referring to is not the actual physical hearing of the ear. What it means is the relationship. If you look those words up in the Greek, you'll realize hearing the voice of the shepherd is actually referring to a familiarity in a relationship to the voice of the shepherd. So it's not about whether you hear it or not. It's about when you hear what you have relationship with. 
Now let's give this example. When a mother is in a grocery store and she hears her child say mom. Now there's other moms in the grocery store and this child cries out mom. There, any of those other mothers have heard that word used to describe them. But none of those other mothers receive. They don't respond to that word when somebody cries out mom, except for the actual mother of that child. Why? Because the mother of that child knows the voice of their child. It's not because they heard the word mom. They might go to another store and another child cries out mom, yet they don't respond to that person. They're responding when they hear the voice of their child because they have that relationship. When my son speaks, I know his voice. It's not that I hear him say it, it's I hear him and because we are in relationship, I know his voice, I know the pitch, I know the tone, I know him. So when he speaks, I know it's him even without looking. I don't have to look to know if it's him speaking to me or not, I know it's him because there's that relationship. The same with other friends of mine. I, I'll give you a great example. When I was picking my prayer partner up from the, from the airport when we were holding our conference in 2022, she said she looked down the airport. Now we're very far away from each other, but she said when she looked, she could see somebody walking. Now she couldn't see my face. She couldn't hear my voice. She didn't know, she couldn't actually know if it was me or not, but she said, by the way you walk, just because of the way I was taking strides as I was walking and I had my boots on, and just because of the way I was walking, she said, I knew it was you. Even without knowing it's me, she knew it was me. <laughs> because we had such a great relationship without even knowing, for, like without seeing it, she knew it. And this is what knowing the voice of the Good Shepherd is all about. Because the confusion part for people is they're like, well, I heard the lie of the devil. I heard the temptation. I thought I wasn't supposed to hear it. No, it doesn't mean that you won't hear the lie. It means you have no relationship with the person speaking the lie. So it's not that you don't hear the things being said. It's we have no fellowship. We have no relationship. And because we have no relationship, I don't follow you. And I don't agree with you because we don't have that relationship for me to be able to do what you are saying. But I am in relationship with the shepherd of the sheep. And because I hear his voice, I follow him. Not because I physically hear it in my ear. It's because when I hear words speaking, I know it's him because I have a, rem I have a relationship and a familiarity with him. What he speaks, I know it's him, even if I don't see him. When you hear words come into your ear, whether it is truth of God or it is a lie of the devil, you have to be able to discern and know who is speaking to you. Well, there's only one way to know if it is the voice of the shepherd or if it is the voice of the stranger is who you have relationship with. Where is your familiarity in? And the only way to have this close familiarity and relationship with the shepherd is through the word. Because Jesus is the word. That's why we put such a great emphasis on studying the word of God. Because when you hear something, it has to be proven. It has to be put to proof. You have to compare it to the word of God and then make a decision on if it is God or not. And the more you know about the Word of God, the faster it becomes. You know, I have people ask me all the time. They'll come up for prayer after a service or even before a service when I'm preaching, and they will ask me certain questions. You know, I gave this example uh, Monday night during our Revelation class. Somebody was asking me, they say, will you pray for me about whether I should marry this person? And I said, is that person a believer? Simple question. No. And I said, well, I don't have to ask God because God's word says you are not to marry a heathen. You are not to marry somebody that is not born again. I said, so I don't have to ask the Lord. Now, can I pray for the spirit of God to draw them to repentance and they get born again? Yes, I can pray for that. I can pray for the anointing that draws, 
but I cannot pray for you to marry this person. I said, because it is against the will of God. I said, but the only way I could know what is the will of God and what is God's voice in a specific situation is I had to know the word of God. So the same way it's important that we prepare ourselves in end time prophecy to prepare ourselves for knowing what's coming later and to prepare ourselves to not be offended and to not be deceived and to not be seduced. The only way to know God's voice to actually be the sheep of the shepherd in that time to actually follow God when the pressure turns on and all the lies and all the deception, all these things are happening in the earth. The only way to be able to know that it's God and to follow him in remaining faithful is you have to know the word of God. That's why we put such an emphasis on studying it. There's a reason why we teach uh, daily teachings Monday through Saturday at 9 a.m. for 30 minutes. That's three hours a week, give or take a few minutes some days, but three hours a week. And then you add on to that our Sunday service, which is anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. And then you do our discipleship classes three times a week. And then you, I mean, there's so many different ways we teach. If you're here in Brazil and you come to our teachings live, we taught the past three days in a row. We're going to be teaching this weekend at a couple different churches. If you come and join us in any of these other areas, I mean, we're teaching over 10 hours a week. But there's a reason why we teach so much of the Word of God. It's because we want to have this close familiarity in our relationship with the Lord so that when we hear the voice, we could be able to discern, it is, the, is it the voice of the shepherd? Do we know, do we have that relationship with him to be able to know when he speaks to follow? Or when we hear something, do we know that that's a lie? It's the voice of the stranger because it does not line up according to the word of God. And we reject the voice of the stranger because we have no relationship with him. It's not actually about what you physically hear. It's about the fact that do I have relationship to know whether it's God or not? We're going to stop here for today. So, Father, bless these people in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Church, I love you. God bless you. Have a great day, and we'll see you tomorrow. The sparrows not worried about tomorrow. Oh, the troubles to come. The lilies not thinking about the seasons. The drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water. Should I be? Cause you take good care of me. You take good care of me. You know what I need before I even ask the thing. And you hold me in your hand with the kindness that never ends. And carry The sun's now